Our plan for tonight, our format for the lecture, is Francis um, is going to introduce the critical theory um, and the concepts that we'll be working for, uh, working on during the, uh, the workshop. And then I'll be talking about my own personal practice as an artist and give examples of my practice and kind of talk about more of the, I guess, um, the application of this theory within the field that I'm working in. And so I'll give a brief background about my practice back in Detroit and then what I've been doing since I've been here in the Philippines. And then after that, we'll have a short little conversation, Francis and I, about um, our goals and our, our hopes for the workshop and basically where we're going to begin tomorrow morning. And then we'll have some time, I guess, or hopefully at the end for questions and any kind of comments anyone here has. So Francis um, is a lecturer at the National College of Art and Design in Dublin, Ireland. And he is the director um, of, a <laughs> of a master's um, in art. Um, course called Art in the Contemporary World. <laughs> Thanks very much. If I speak like this, can everybody hear me? Uh, okay, hi. <laughs> if I put it down like that and speak like that, is that still good? Yes. Okay, that's much easier then. Brilliant, thank you. Um, yes. Sure, I guess, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's fine, yeah. So, I'm going to do three things. I'm, I'm hoping it takes about 15 minutes, 20 minutes perhaps. Um, and then, as Kelly said, she's going to talk about her practice, and then hopefully we'll get a chance to have a conversation with ourselves and with you about what we want to achieve here. And actually, this idea of it being a conversation is where we started and where we're at right now in terms of our relationship. We met a year ago when I was <clears throat> a visiting fellow at Cranbrook, just outside Detroit, which is an art and design college, which maybe some of you know in North America, uh, where I was a visiting resident giving uh, classes, seminars, and so forth on the theme, and public lectures, on the theme of system and object. And this is my sort of general area. Oh, I should say, I'm going to talk about three things here, actually, within that, um, these 20 minutes. Firstly, this idea of systems and what that means. Secondly, some more um, particular vocabularies that we'd like to explore in the workshop. Um, there are three or four of them that myself and Kelly in particular have been working with. Um, talk very, very briefly about the relationship between system and body, because, it, again, that's something that we're very, very interested in. Um, because when you talk about the body, you then start to talk about space, place, sight, and also aesthetics, because the aesthetics always involves the body, the body that senses, that tastes, that sees, that touches, and hears, and so on. Okay, so talk briefly about this idea of system and what it means to think about system, then to talk about some specific vocabularies, then talk a little bit about the body, and then fourthly, and what I think I'll do very, very kind of quickly, because I don't want to dwell on them too much, but I've got some examples of art practice that might apply to this. Okay? Again, can you all still hear me? Okay, good. It's a bit weird being in the dark and seeing everybody in the light, so... Okay, I'll just go with it. <laughs> um, so, our relationship started when we started having conversations about what it means to talk about system in relation to practice. And the reason I'm spending some time emphasizing um, this at the moment is that <coughs> that's the spirit of our project. What we're trying to do here is find a way in which a theorist, and that's me, and I work in quite abstract philosophical theory most of the time. My background is art history, but I moved from that into thinking about philosophy. So thinking about the way artists, but also philosophers have thought in terms of systems. And that means sometimes a quite technical thing and something quite specific. But I don't make things. I write, but I can't draw, I can't build buildings, I can barely cook, I can only just about manage to administer my life. Um, so I'm a kind of a theorist, and the conversation and the relationship has grown because we've been trying to negotiate what it means to deal with theory in practice. Okay, and I, Kelly's going to be talking a little bit more about that. 
And I want to emphasize this at the beginning because this is speculative. It might fail. We don't know where it's going to go. And like any conversation, we haven't decided, we don't know what the end point will be. So in part, this workshop is the first of many, we hope anyway, of these kind of continued conversations in different contexts. It's absolutely fantastic having the first of these sort of more formal or public conversations in the context of um, the Philippines, given the reputation of this university and particularly this architecture department. So that's really, really kind of great. But we're not quite sure where it will go. And to a large extent, that, that's over to the participants in the workshop to see where that conversation will take us. But the spirit of the conversation then is one about what the relationship between theory on the one hand and practice on the other might mean. And for my part, I don't think you can make a kind of a, a stark distinction between the two anyway. I work then. Does anybody have any water at some point yeah. in the next? <laughs> Thank you. I'm still getting used to the heat. I'm from Ireland, which is very cold and very wet, particularly right now. Thanks, Ken. I think you can just use the space bar. I can what? Change your the space bar. Oh, cool. In part, then, my interest in thinking about systems is a, is, is a kind of a <laughs> there you go. So I told you I was only ba barely practical. I mean, um, in part, then, my interest in systems is, is sort of, I, I guess, three part. One is kind of historical, the way in which system emerges as a kind of a particular way of understanding the world. And I have an argument that actually thinking in systems is another way of thinking about a definition of modernity. But, it's a very modern way of thinking, a way of thinking about way is, um, the way in which the world is interconnected or things are interconnected. Secondly, as I've got some examples to show you here, it's a way of thinking through our contemporary moment, that we think in terms of systems and that systems are ubiquitous, as we'll see in just a sec. And then thirdly, perhaps more particular, and where I'll get to at the very, very end, is, is the way in which artists, contemporary artists, mostly from a Western perspective in this in instance, as North, uh, Northern European and North American in this instance, because that's the area in which I work, have very self-consciously used systems as part of their practice. In simplistic terms, this means artists not making objects, but engaging in systems of distribution, networks of communication, and so on and so on. Systems, as we see, though, are everywhere. They're a function of contemporary life. That's why I'm interested in them. We might see things like shaving systems, and I could go on and on and on. And if I'd had a bit more time, I might have found some um, more local examples. Healthcare systems. Key ring systems. And so on and so on and so on. And this has become part of a kind of a, almost a hobby of mine now, to find ways in which systems are being used, um, often very kind of unself- uh, unconsciously as a way of kind of understanding the way in which the world fits together. When Edward Snowden um, made his revelations in 2013 about the NSA, the phrase he used, I used to have this quote on a, on a slide, was that um, <clears throat> when we don't take responsibility um, for surveillance and so forth, critical systems crash. Critical systems crash. Systems are everywhere. They're part of our everyday life. We're embedded in them um, we are embedded in them and they sort of frame um, the way in which we live our lives. What does it mean then, and this is the, the, the kind of the first question for the workshop to address, what does it mean to think about the world in terms of systems rather than in terms of, let's say, people or individuals? Okay? That's, that's the kind of one of the first questions that we might start to think about. And that, in part, was one of the first questions that myself and Kelly started talking about. What does it mean to think about our environment? not in terms of specific histories, although histories emerge, not in terms of individual people, not even in terms of formal architecture, and we'll talk about this in just a sec, like buildings, say. What does it mean to think about environments, not in terms of those criteria, but question, oh, brilliant, thank you. What does it mean to think about environments in terms of systems? And if that is the, if that is the case, what does it mean to think that we are part of systems? I'm talking quite abstractly at this point of systems and, and, 
when we might think about what that might mean. Perhaps over the next couple of days, we might start to unpack what it means to think in terms of system. There isn't time to go into a huge amount of detail at this point. I've got a couple of slides, two or three um, points down the line, where we, we have got some definitions of systems, and we can start to think about what it means to think about um, the things that we sometimes think about in certain terms in terms of systems. One of the negative points about thinking about a system, and we might think about economic systems, or social systems, um, or computer systems, or communication systems, or even weather systems. There's a number of ways in which we might think about um, sort of systems as being this network of interconnected elements. One of the negative features of this is that if we think about the world, or the economy, um, or weather even, um, or perhaps the environment, or even architecture, or a city, or a society, or any of these sort of big things in terms of system. One of the negative features of this is that perhaps individual humans get lost within that. One of the guys I work on, who we're not going to talk about here, a German sociologist called Niklas Luhmann, um, who was writing up until the very end of the 20th century, said that the only way to understand society from the last couple of hundred years is not to think about individuals. He said, we can no longer think about society as being constructed from or built upon the foundation of individual humans, of individual subjectivity. He said, think about society in this way is naive, it's wrong-headed, and so on. Society, he said, is not comprised of individuals. Society is comprised of systems. Economic systems, legal systems, science systems, art systems, and so on and so on. So interconnected patterns of behaviors, and so on. This is very, very troubling. This is a very kind of troubling way of thinking about the way in which the world works. Because if the world is comprised of systems fundamentally, then it would seem that it's no longer comprised of individuals. Um, and the individual, the I, the kind of the heart of models of democracy, for example, is a very sort of powerful idea that people like to hold on to very, very kind of strongly. I'm making no judgment about that at this particular moment. I'm just putting this out there. So this is a negative way, perhaps, of thinking about society or environment or architecture or the economy or whatever in terms of system. What that does is it means that we're no longer thinking about it in terms of individual human action or individual human agency. That's troubling. <laughs> the positive side of this, perhaps, the other side of that is that what thinking in systems might allow us to do is think in terms of broad pictures. It might give us overviews. It might allow us to think about situations, environments, and contexts without focusing on individuals or the particularly human. It might allow us to think of environments without having to make a strong distinction, for example, or a binary um, distinction between the natural and the cultural, um, or between the human and the non-human, between the I and the other. If we start to think about environments in terms of systems, perhaps we can start to think about more broader patterns um, and so on. Again, I do appreciate that at this point I'm talking very, very kind of abstractly. Um, I'm kind of hoping that you're going with me a certain part of the way. Part of the trouble about talking about systems theory, for example, and systems theory comes out of things like cybernetics, neo-cybernetics, communication theory, information theory, and so on, um, is that it gets very technical very, very kind of quickly. So I'm keeping it abstract and I'm keeping it general deliberately because these are abstract and general kind of points. Perhaps in the conversation that we're about to have, and perhaps over the next couple of days we can start to unpack in a little bit more detail what it might mean to talk about system. Is, that, am I, is there anything needs clarifying at this point? <laughs> okay. Secondly then, these are some starting points. Okay, so I've got four starting points here and then there's a couple more. Perhaps particular definitions of, of sort of system. <coughs> these first starting points, I'll read them out as well. Um, are starting points that myself and Kelly took for the workshop. Okay, so um, particular vocabularies that we are interested in kind of um, investigating. And in all of these, 
these vocabularies suggest some way of thinking about the relationship between um, abstract um, theorizing and then its concrete application between um, theory and practice, for want of a better word, although I am myself slightly uneasy about that, kind of making a split between practice over here and theory over here. But these seem to be vocabularies that we both understood and felt that we were able to work with. And in part then, these, because these terms seemed to talk to, and this is our key point, if you take nothing else away um, from today, just take this away. The key point being that aesthetic practices, whatever they may be, engaging in space in some capacity, aesthetic practices might have some sort of theoretical outcomes. Okay? That by working and operating in space, you might find a way of making sort of theory concrete, realizable, understandable, or graspable in some way. The first of these terms then comes from Frederick Jameson, a Marxist critic, American. Um, he first uses this term in his um, account of postmodernism, but he uses it subsequently. And this is a little jargon heavy, but there's something very simple at the heart of it. And this is where we took our, our title from, this idea of a cognitive mapping. Okay, because I think that's in part what we're interested in doing. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'll read Jameson's quote here. In a classic work, The Image of the City, Kevin Lynch taught us that the alienated city is above all a space in which people are unable to map in their minds either their own positions or the urban totality in which they find themselves. Grids such as those of Jersey City in North America, in which none of the traditional markers, monuments, nodes, natural boundaries, built perspectives obtain, are the most obvious examples. Cognitive mapping enables a situational representation on the part of the individual subject to that vaster and properly unrepresentable totality which is the ensemble of society's structures as a whole. As I say, there's quite a lot going on there in terms of a kind of jargon. But at the heart of it, there's something very, very kind of simple, which is that for Jameson, things like maps, photographs, graphs, bar charts, and simplistic two-dimensional representations of a city do not effectively map or give a representation of what it means to experience a city. Okay, so he's looking for ways in which people might be, might be able to kind of map their position within what he calls an urban totality more effectively. Now for him then, things like artworks, fiction, movies, in particular conspiracy um, movies. He's really keen on like 1970s conspiracy films, for example. He says that in these fictions, they actually contain certain kind of truths about the conditions of power in global capitalism. Okay, is this making sense? Do you want to pick me up on? That? In very very simplistic terms, what he says is that there's there's a there's, there's a kind of truth, perhaps even an objectivity, but we have to be careful about that use of the word. But like fictions might reveal certain conditions of experience in a way that um, other forms of representation may not. Because they might reveal some elements of experience that might be hidden through other representations. To take that one sort of theoretical stage further, for Jameson, idea... Oh, sorry. <laughs> For Jameson, working within a Marxian perspective, ideology, and for him the ideology of capitalism, doesn't work at the level of representation. He's not saying that reality is sort of hidden behind representations. For him, postmodern ideology operates at the level of reality itself. Okay? So the way in which the world is experienced, he says, is shaped fundamentally and kind of unavoidably by the operations of global capital, the operation of the, of the world system, he calls it. Global capitalism is, for him, inescapable. So for him, forms of fiction-making, forms of aesthetic practice might be a way of thinking about or revealing the conditions by which capitalism operates on our lives, okay. is what he argues. The um, English critic, 
Mark Fisher, who writes in his little book, which is a brilliant little book because it's, it's short, it's punchy, it's polemic, and it's, very, it, you know, it's an easy read, asks a question which Jameson had posed, um, the Marxian, Lacanian, Hegelian, whatever you want to call him, critique Slavoj Žižek had also said, which is that it, in, in this day and age, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. And so we can just look at all these Hollywood movies that have been produced over the last 20 years, which imagine the end of the world through um, ecological crisis, but none of them imagine the end of capitalism. Capitalism still kind of continues. And that's part of the point that's being kind of put forward here, which is a, again, a very, very kind of abstract point in some respects, but abstract because it's fundamental and very, very kind of basic, which is that ideology, the ideology of capitalism, operates on a kind of a global level and shapes the way life is lived. The challenge becomes then, or the challenge that we're interested in, is you know, how to think around, above, through that, if you like. You know, how, what does it mean to think about our situation, our environment, as a system that's shaped in a certain way and that we are positioned within in a certain way? Third quote comes from the um, architect and architectural theorist, Realm Marota, where he talks about a distinction between static and kinetic architecture. And for him, static architecture is the concrete construction of a built environment. The roads, the buildings, the formal infrastructure, which can be properly, uh, probably quite easily imagined, quite easily mapped, quite easily shown. Because it is concrete, I don't mean literally made out of um, concrete. It's actual and physical in some um, fundamental sense. Whereas for him, he talks about um, an importance in thinking about a kinetic architecture, which isn't static because it moves. It moves with its people. It moves with um, the operations and flows of systems. It moves according to different experiences, according to the way in which that static architecture is lived in and lived through. The kinetic city then, he says, is constantly changing in a way in which the static city is not changing, because the static city is physical rather than emotional or experiential. The kinetic city is incomprehensible as a two-dimensional entity or as a particular type of map, perhaps. The kinetic city is a city in motion, a three-dimensional construct of incremental development. The kinetic city is temporary in nature, and often built with recycled material, plastic sheets, scrap metal, canvas, and waste wood. Now, he's talking here particularly about the architecture of um, Mumbai and the architecture in, in India, but it doesn't, it doesn't only apply to this, I think, is, is, is the kind of point. We're talking here about kind of the way in which a, an environment is lived in provisionally. It constantly modifies and reinvents itself. The kinetic city's building blocks are not pieces of architecture, but spaces that hold associative values. And let's hold on to that because I think that's one thing that we're very interested in think, talking about over the next couple of days. What spaces might we engage in and what values are associated with those spaces? And how are those values not always mapped in particular ways? Or how might we map them or represent them? Spaces that hold associative values that support their residents' lives and livelihoods. Patterns of occupation determine its form and perception. And this leads on to the final point where I said I was going to kind of talk about body, although very, very kind of quickly, because it relates to all of these three points <coughs> previously said. Patterns of occupation, okay, the way in which spaces are occupied, lived in, and lived through, are fundamentally coupled to the way in which those spaces are perceived and experienced. And they're perceived and experienced by bodies, like this one. And that leads on to that final point then, the Irish psychologist, Kieran Benson, talking about the way in which the body itself is a system, a system of location. Okay, that the body is positioned not as a unique, autonomous um, entity, but is actually located within a system of meanings, of habits, of patterns, of affordances, of possibilities, of potentials, and so on. Okay? 
that the body has potential, but the body also has limits. The body can perceive certain things, but is also unable to perceive certain things. The body can move through certain spaces, but is denied access to other spaces. That the body engages with these systems that we're talking about here, which we're saying are related to ideology, right? by moving through those spaces and being related to perception. I hope I've said that in sufficient detail. I know that there's a lot going on there, but in very, very kind of simplistic terms, we want to think about the way in which space is related to body, and we might think about this through system. Because what's going to happen over the next couple of days is we're all going to take our own bodies out into spaces and think about what we can experience and how we might represent what we can experience thinking about them in terms of the way in which those bodies, our bodies, are positioned within systems, spatial systems, systems of possibilities, systems and so on and so on. Should I be wrapping things up? Yeah. So what? Oh, five minutes. Okay, cool. Uh, So I'm still on my second point. Two more things to do. Firstly, I've just got a couple of very, very kind of simple definitions of what system might mean to help us think about what I'm talking about here. And I start with this first one because I think it's important to see that there's actually quite a long history for thinking in terms of system. And this is what I mean when I say that actually there's a kind of there's quite a long history and actually another way of talking about modernism, and I know that's a very problematic term, in relation to this idea of system. I have an argument that I'm developing elsewhere that actually in system we might find an alternative account or theory of modernism. So you can go all the way back to the 18th century the first dictionary that's written by Samuel Johnson, the Scottish scholar, so written in Britain. Even as early as 1755, we get a definition of system. A combination of many things which act together. Okay, so how might bodies interact together? How might body interact with space? How might body interact with architecture? How might architecture interact with space? How might architecture interact with economy? How might economy interact with body? And so on and so on and so on. How are things interconnected? A system is a scheme which reduces many things to regular dependence or cooperation. Or perhaps a scheme which unites many things in order. So in very, very simple terms, and I think we all probably have a a very, you know, we have a working understanding of what system means, which is things operate together to do something that those things wouldn't do by themselves. You find that in Kenneth Boulding, so we're going through to the 20th century. The broadest possible definition of a system is that anything that is not chaos. We could turn the pattern around and define a system as any structure that exhibits order and pattern. And that's the thing we want to look at over the next couple of days. Where might we find order where it perhaps wasn't obvious before? How might we find interconnected things? How might we find order and pan in ways that well, maybe we had thought about it before, but how might, how might we represent those orders and those patterns? That's something I'm interested in because, as I say, I deal with this on a really abstract level. That's what's been really interesting talking to Kelly because she, as an artist and architect, she's in the business of finding order and pan, perhaps where it hadn't been found before. That's what artists do. To think in systems is to make sense of the complexity and of the world in terms of holes and relationships, rather than splitting the world into its parts and looking at each in isolation. That comes back to the point I said right at the beginning, which can sometimes be troubling, because if sort of splitting into the world into individual humans, for example, we start to think about, and thinking about those in isolation, we start thinking about humans in relation to things that they're also related to, how they might be part of other kind of social units or other networks and so on. Sometimes that troubling it can also be helpful and useful ways of thinking about society. But in part, then, it means making sense of the complexity of the world in terms of these patterns and interconnections. And again, talking really, really abstractly here, but that's what we want to do through the workshop, right? Make sense of the complexity of the world if it's not too grand. Or make sense of the complexity of a little tiny part of the world. Maybe we should be more modest in what we're going to claim we're going to be able to do. Um, Okay, so that's the second part. Very, very kind of quickly, I've just got some quick examples here of contemporary artists who are arguably thinking in terms of system. Now, in terms of sort of the way in which... Well, I'll just go into talk about them, will I? Will I spend two minutes on these? Yeah, okay. 
here's some artists who've looked at systems, right? And you, what you can see here in all of these instances is artists who are clearly not making single objects. They're not painters or they're not sculptors. And they're clearly thinking about their own practice as embedded within kind of not larger um, networks of communication, um, meaning, and so on. The first of these is a Brazilian artist. Forgive my Brazilian. I think it's Sildo Morelos, unless somebody wants to correct me. No? <laughs> okay. Um, And this, this is an interesting project because it, it forms part of um, a, a kind of a larger movement within Brazil, which is very, very kind of highly politically motivated, um, in part taking some of the strategies of North American conceptual art, which is often about moving from an art object into art as idea or dematerialization of an art object and so on, and thinking about art as, as conceptual rather than object making. But given that this was produced in Brazil against the kind of um, backdrop of the military junta and Vargas and so on, these are often highly politicized. And one of the, the things they take as their objects is um, American hegemonic and um, cultural hegemony in, in Brazil in particular. For these pieces then, Morelos makes these very subtle, quite slight insertions into ideological circuits as we see here. So, one of the projects involves taking Coca-Cola bottles, which are recycled, and then printing anti-American slogans on them. Right? So a very kind of small, subtle gesture, and then just putting them back into the system. We're taking that symbol of American um, economic and cultural imperialism and kind of subverting it, putting it back into a system. But you wouldn't say here that there's an artist making sculptural objects or very kind of individual things or something. Does the same with... Um, check everything was coming up. Same with um, banknotes as well, again, kind of printing, um, making these kind of small interventions on, in an economic system. Okay, so paper money is an abstract economic system. Um, and it's around this time that actually America abandons the gold standard, right? So it's about to become more abstract. Um, stamp slogans on them, puts them back into the system. So by making these kind of subtle insertions into these ideological circuits, hopefully, and of course, maybe we don't agree with that gesture as being effective, and there is a debate as to whether art can ever be effective in social situations. Arguably, well, part of the um, aspiration, at least, let's, let's call it that, is that one might draw attention to the kind of the operation of a particular type of system um, and the way in which it has a particular effect on in framing one's life. That's the first artist. The second artist is Liam Gillick, who I'm going to pick here as um, indicative of um, absolutely exemplary, exemplary of a contemporary artistic practice. Someone who, again, doesn't make single things, but as a contemporary artist, engages in whatever system he has to hand for making and distributing his work. Okay, so here you see him, there's Gillick on the right, but with the actress Tilda Swinton, who's an Oscar-winning actress, I believe, a British actress. Um, with a, do you see Alistair Carr, a designer? So you've got here an artist engaging with um, an actress, with a designer, making design objects, but also making bags, which are like high-end commodities. So he inserts himself into these kind of further systems, making Pringle jumpers. Okay, so... Perhaps to a certain extent, rather like stamping the banknotes or stamping the Coca-Cola bottles, inserting himself into these kind of systems, perhaps, as a way of drawing attention to the way in which these kind of operate. Now, again, I'm not claiming that he's bringing about the fall of Western capitalism. Um, <clears throat> what I'm saying is you've got here an example of a contemporary practitioner who is working according to the systems of distribution that they have to hand. As he says of his own work, a discursive model of practice has developed within the critical art context over the tw past 20 years. It's the offspring of critical theory and improvised self-organized structures. The condition of contemporary art, it is the basis of art that involves the dissemination of information. It plays with social models and pre presents speculative constructs both within and beyond traditional gallery spaces. 
It is indebted to conceptual arts reframing of relationship, and it requires decentered and revised histories in order to resolve. And, and ask this question, maybe it would be better if we worked in groups of three. I'm not saying that what we're going to do is have those kind of outcomes precisely for the reason that I think what we're going to be doing is working with different systems, okay? different systems of distribution and orientation. But I think there is something there that might, we might see a kind of a connection to. Oh, sorry. He's also an actor. So artist as designer, furniture designer, um, actor, or um, maker of sculptures. And in part, one of the reasons he makes these objects is because it allows him to assert himself into the, the kind of the gallery system. These are things that can be bought and sold, circulate around the world according to the kind of the gallery system. Um, skip through because there's just two more examples because I know I'm running out of time. Um, penultimate example is Theastic Gates, a Chicago based artist who, for his work, by simplistic terms, buys houses, does them up, renovates them, and then sells them on. And he works in, in particular, he worked in a, a project. So, a disenfranchised area, a black area um, in Chicago. Moved into the area, regenerated the area, and considered this part of his practice. Right? Now, the criticism of this is that this is not art anymore. He's doing something else. His response is, well, it's the job of the contemporary artist to engage in real-life concrete social situations, and that art, or the, the, the label of artist, allows him to do that. So here you see for this Dorchester project, he's acquired an abandoned two-story property for reuse as a library, slide archive, and soul food kitchen. The, cr the, criti the criticism of this is, um, from only last year, put cynically, Gates' ecological system, where he takes a kind of a, a, a run-down area of Chicago. Gates' ecological system involves the Rebuild Foundation, that's the project he works with, acting as a kind of feel-good money laundering facility for the commercial art world and corporate developers. And this is what enables his status as a popularizer. So the art then becomes part of this kind of process of um, gentrification, turning poor real estate into expensive real estate by virtue of the fact that it's been turned into art. And we need to ask ourselves what are the pros and cons of this. We're obviously not going to be doing anything like this over the next couple of days, but this is another example of a kind of a practice engaging with social situations, something that Kelly has been kind of partially involved in. When I move on, is this a good point to stop? Okay. Yeah, I'll stop here, because there are other examples of this. Is good. Thank you. And I'll pass over to Kelly. He's good. So basically, um, on the right is the school that I went to in um, Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. On the left is a house that could either be in Detroit or Pontiac. So basically, this is Detroit, Michigan, which is a bankrupt city. So it's under emergency city management by the state and not the city. And the city has no money, and it kind of looks awful. Like the roads are completely disrepair, in complete disrepair. Half the houses are abandoned. There's no public services, no public transportation. A lot of violence and like no police or fire services within the area. And then at the other end of this road, which is this red line, 25 miles apart, is Pontiac, Michigan, which is in the same condition that Detroit finds itself in. Uh, completely bankrupt, devoid of services, with an ever decreasing population as people flee the city for better opportunities and jobs. And then Cranbrook Academy Art is located in Bloomfield Hills, which is the fourth richest place in America. And that is located right here, in between the two. So that was kind of the beginning of my art practice in dealing with these kinds of issues, is living in Pontiac and going to school in the fourth richest place in America and trying to understand how these two places can be seven miles apart and find themselves in completely drastic, like completely opposite situations. There used to be a river that ran through the center of town, which is the screen on the right. And then in the 60s, when the population started to decline, currently the, the city's population right now as, is where it is, where it was in 1890. So when the city started to lose its population in 1960, 
they took the river and they put it in a pipe, which is this, I'm tracing the line of the pipe, um, and ran it under the city to create a more vibrant downtown, which actually caused the decline of the business, of the central business district in the downtown. So there's a direct relationship between these rivers and systems of economy and malls and shopping within the city center. Um, so sometimes the, the river and the pipe line up, and then there's other times, as you see with the video, where they start to pull apart and go their separate ways, depending on how, I guess, they had to pipe the river through the city. So this video is around five minutes long, but we're not going to watch the whole thing. Um, but you get the general idea. This is my um, thesis work that I did for my graduation in May. And basically, I was trying to still find the connections between these systems of Pontiac and Bloomfield Hills. So this is Hubert Price. He was a Black Panther um, in the 60s, which I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the African American Civil Rights Movement. There was these rather aggressive African Americans who carried guns around and were very, and were talking a lot about trying to get the, their own African American state within the United States as their own autonomous region. Um, so he fought pretty hard and was good friends with Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and he actually lives in Pontiac and is very active in the, um, like, in, I guess, politics in the area. So him and I started hanging out and learning a lot about the history and kind of doing some investigative research on the culture and the black um, community in Pontiac, which around the same time that they piped that river through the town was destroyed for the reasons that they had to pipe the river through the area, um, which is kind of a subversive way the people in power who at that time were white used to disperse this powerful and this, I guess, um, motivated black community within the area. So then we started to look at the connections between Pontiac and Cranbrook. And so my thesis piece is a, a sign that mirrors national landmark sites that we have in the United States. And on one side, it talks about the history of this area of the black neighborhood called the corner. And then on the other side, it talks about the people of power, the people who owned Cranbrook, working with the, pe with the um, black population in the corner. And then some of the people from the black population of the corner actually attending Cranbrook. So we tried to talk about how these systems constantly depend on each other and work together, even when they seem like they're in opposition, they still are interconnected. Um, and there's even connections between Cranbrook and Pontiac today. That's where most of the students live. One of the faculty members is building a tennis club there. There's lots of connections that you can see today. So they're still part of the same system regardless if they seem that way. So since coming to, this is really small, I apologize. Since coming to the Philippines, um, when I got here I realized that the Philippines is a really cool place for several reasons. One of which being, um, it's the only place in the world where the national fast food chain, Jollibee, um, is bigger than McDonald's. It doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. Like everywhere else, that has their own native fast food chain, it's secondary or even like tertiary to McDonald's, which is always with the powerhouse. So there's something really inter interesting happening with like the capitalistic society in the Philippines that's able to subvert this global capitalism for a cultural and national capitalism. So I started to, I found every single Jollibee in the national capital region. There's 256 of them. And I'm in the process of visiting every single one of them. Um, so far, I've visited close to 80. And I just go up and I take a picture of the entrance to the Jollibee and I move on to the next. It takes me about eight hours to visit 15 of them. So it takes a lot of time. But it's been pretty fun and I've learned a lot in, a, in the process of using Jollibee as this sense of a locative system. And it helps me orient myself within Metro Manila which for a foreigner is very confusing. So the way I've learned my way around the Philippines has basically been by using Jollibee's as a computer system. And I started to actually like become very familiar with 
each individual Jollibee, and so whenever I get lost, I find one, and I'm like, oh, I know exactly where I am now, and I can figure out how to get home. <laughs> but it seriously does work, and it is like, and I've learned a lot about the Philippines in the process, especially Metro Manila, and so I find it really helpful, and also it's a really interesting project. So I keep, so my goal is to take a picture of every single one before I leave, and create a like poster sizes of each of all of each poster will hold like 20 jelly bees and so I'll have like 10 or so of these posters to show as one piece of work. Um, most of my research since coming here takes place in Piazzas, so um, about 25 minutes north of here. Um, I live there half the time and then I live over across the street from Ateneo the other half of the time. And so I've gotten to know the community really well, and I live with a family there, and I, I guess most of my friends are seven-year-old kids. Um, and so after some talks with some of the, uh, the people that I'm friends with, and we were talking about the difference between the rice terraces in Benai and the poverty there, and then the poverty in, the, in Piazzas. And so we were talking about, like, this is with Piazzas residents, um, we were talking about the difference in these two communities and how one is treasured and seen as this place where you like, that is, I guess, a manicured, sculptured, like, landscape that has been created by people in turn to provide them with livelihood and opportunities. And how at the end of the day, the landfill is essentially that same thing. It's actually become, as, like, as we've talked about, a, la a new landmass and this manicured, sculptured uh, landmass that also provides livelihood and money and support for the families. And so, at the end of the day, you could start to talk about how these two things are the same thing, the rice terraces and the landfill, and their relationship to the communities and the surrounding environment. And so we started talking about the idea of trying to get Piazzas declared as a World Heritage Site. And so in the process, I've met with um, the National Commission on Cultures and the Arts in there, and the guy who runs the, who manages the World Heritage Sites. And I have a meeting early next month with the National UNESCO World Heritage Committee to present my ideas and talk about this, and, ha and uh, present my research and talk about, I guess, further steps in which we can start to learn more about this site and start to respect the kinds of heritage that come from these environments. Um, so I deal a lot with the kinetic environments that are seen in Piazzas and in a lot of informal settlements. Um, so then I a project that Francis and I, we went to Bohol two days ago to start was analyzing how there's this constant migration since like the 70s of people from the provinces, specifically the Visayas and a lot of the typhoon ridden areas to Piazzas for, I guess, livelihood opportunities as well as safety and to be close to family members because so many of their family members have been migrating there for the past 50 years. So this is Amor, and she's from Ponga Pasan Island, which is off the coast of Tubigan. And um, so I, I've been talking to her about the reasons for migrating. She moved to Piazzas two years ago from Ponga Pasan Island, um, which has a population of like maybe 200, if even that. And you can walk around the entire island in about 10 minutes. So this is a video about her telling me about why she moved there. And then through our documentation and our research, we're going to create a longer video about where she's from, where she lives, and then her reasons for moving, as well as create a text about her, or about migrations and this move that happens all over the world to global, or to areas of global capital, which are usually the national capital as well. So, how do I make this play? Does anyone know? I guess we'll be coming up here, right? <laughs> Will it play? Okay, so it's okay if we don't have sound on this one, I guess. Okay. 
araw-araw ng mga bata ng high school ang kaya lang sa Balaran kami pumunta ng Manila para maghanap ng trabaho, makapag-aral ng mga bata. Kaya napunta kami dito sa Payatas. So, there's more to it, but that's just a, I guess, a teaser. Oh, why don't you stay here? The next one, I'll leave your bubble tip. Uh, <laughs> so, these are some of my friends in Payatas. And um, I've been interviewing a lot of children, and I've been talking to kids, and I've been hanging out with a lot of the kids, because they seem the most receptive to talking to me. And <laughs> they have nothing else to do with their time. Everyone else is working. Um, so I've been trying to really understand what it means to live in Payatas and how, like, what is the actual perspective of these kids? Because there's so many NGOs that work in the area. That, like, this one guy is really ridiculous. He moved to Payatas because he wanted to give everyone hot water heaters for their showers so they could have warm showers. And was not under the, and I guess was completely clueless in realizing that a lot of these people don't even have running water. And no one in the Philippines wants to take a hot shower. It's incredibly hot here. <laughs> so, um, like, it seems like a lot of people are moving to this area and are trying to do what they think these people need. Um, and are saying like, well, these people need this thing and these people need this thing. And don't really spend a lot of time talking to the people and trying to figure out what they need. And this happens a lot when you talk about relocations of them trying to move people to other areas and building these other houses for them like and there's a lot of organizations that say like if we give these people a new house their life will be better not realizing that their life is here and so I've just been trying to talk to kids and these kids have told me some really weird stories one kid told me about getting bit in the air by a cockroach and getting some kind of disease another kid I would play the clip but it won't sound really great but another kid told me that he wants to join the military to defend the Philippines against Americans. Um, so I'm not sure if he was talking about me. Or... So I've been trying to collect these quotes from these kids and these kids telling me all these things. And like, I've become really good friends with the kids in the process and they've started to open up to me about more things. And some of the stories are really sad. Like some kids have told me they have no ambitions because they live next to a garbage like dump. But other kids have told me like they want to become veterinarians. But then some of them just tell me about like playing this game called 2010 and their POG collection. Um, and so you get a lot of mixed results and you get a lot of really interesting stories. And some of them are, and like they're really random and some of them have no point. And that's part of the process. It's like by understanding how these people live and by understanding these kids, like you have a better insight into the actual community and their lives. So it's been really fun, and I've made a lot of cool friends. Um, oh. OK, so that's a brief interview, or I guess like introduction, into my practice as an artist, which basically means that like most of my work doesn't look like traditional artwork. And a lot of it looks kind of boring. Um, but it. <laughs> laughing. Um, but I, I think I'm interested in the process of, or like the idea is that in the f fact that a lot of it is not aesthetically pleasing, it starts to talk about these other issues about systems and how sometimes systems aren't necessarily the most aesthetically pleasing or the most interesting thing, but they still play into the culture and these ideas about trying to understand our environments in which we live. And so sometimes those environments are not necessarily physical architecture or physical space, but are about interactions and understanding each other. Um, so it is about architecture, even if it might not seem that way. Um, and it is about art. And I try to create this overlap of the two ideas about like space and um, I guess how we interpret our use of space and how sometimes that changes depending on our mood or the people we're with or what. But then also how do we aesthetically realize these intangible aspects of architecture, which then becomes the art process. Um, so to talk briefly about some ideas for the workshop and some things to take home with you tonight for tomorrow. So, and we'll talk about these again tomorrow at the beginning of the workshop. I had some examples of, of maps that are not or that 
if we read them the right way, we can start to understand unique things about the environment that are illustrated in these maps to give us some ideas about techniques for mapping and things we can understand or things we can take away from maps and then maybe abstract further into aesthetic practices, which would then be like, I don't want to say art objects because sometimes it's not a physical object, but it can be anything from like a performance to sound recordings to, I mean, I guess the, the options are endless. So in my, where I come from in architecture school, everybody knows this. Is this something you guys are familiar with? Do you know the Noli plan? Okay, so this is the Noli plan, and it's a plan of Rome that was done in the 1700s. But what's different about this is it's not representing building and street. It's representing public and private space. So if you look at this, you guys can Google it and find some really great images at home. I realize this is kind of small. This right here is the Pantheon. And so it shows the plaza in front as white because it's public. But then it shows the, in, the inside of it. And each of the naves are also white because those are publicly accessible space. But then over here, this entire block is black because those are private residences. And so they become private space. And so it's an interesting way of trying to talk about accessibility within a city. And this was actually used up until the 1970s as the reference map for any kind of construction or any work and any kind of identification within the city of Rome. And it's huge. Like, this is only a part of it. Um, so it's really interesting to talk about ideas of accessibility and what that means to space. That space is not always outside or inside. But as you can see with a lot of these things, flows between the two without disruption. Um, this next one, this is Maginawa Street. So I'm sure you've all been there or are familiar with it. And so the ideas that I think are really interesting here is on the north, or I guess that's the north side, um, you have a pretty formal street grid. And you see some pretty formal, traditional looking houses. Not traditional in the long sense, but in the term of just, they look like how we expect houses to look. And then you start to see this breakdown of this grid on this side of the street as the neighborhood extends into informal settlements. And so that's not just a physical difference, but that also becomes a livelihood difference. Like you can imagine how much this person makes per year versus this person. You can imagine the kind of activities that can happen in that house versus in this house. You can imagine the types of jobs those people have are going to be drastically different. And then you can imagine like even things from sounds and smells and the sights that you would see wandering through those areas. And then also your sense of safety, your sense of navigation, all of those things change between these two environments, which are a short walk apart. And so there's so many things that are happening there that are not just aesthetic. And those are things we can start to think of when we start to analyze UP's, I guess, grounds and environment, is this change in the change in our own emotional state, but then also the changes us being in that area um, have on the surroundings. So like how we affect our environment. And granted, my effect on any environment here in the Philippines is drastically different than yours, um, because I'm a foreigner and I don't know where I am half the time. Um, so that's something really important to think about, is how these things, these areas are culturally different. And then this is really close to when I went to school. This is Detroit on um, this side of this road. This is the divider line between Detroit. And this is Gross Point, which is the second richest place in America. So you have two of the top five richest places within 30 minutes drive of Detroit. While Detroit is one of the most dangerous and most poorest and isol or I guess desolate places and you can see that visually, that all these, like every single one of these spots used to have a house. It used to be just as dense, if not more dense than this below, and it's changed. So you can imagine the economic impact that's had on the city. You can imagine how this person feels living in this house and looking at this, and they're very close, and how that effect happens immediately. The city is literally bankrupt, right? And it's in emergency administration, and there aren't elected officials in Detroit. So it's, it represents a particular moment of global capitalism. You've got Dublin, which, 
Ireland also represents a particular moment within global capitalism, particularly Ireland, um, Europe, sorry, because the euro, the euro which is the, the currency across all of Europe, would have collapsed if they hadn't bailed the Irish banks out. So Ireland is very, very kind of particular in terms of illustrating a moment in global capitalism as well. Um, and the rhetoric is that the EU you know, bailed Ireland out. It's utterly the other way around. The people of Ireland bailed the EU out because everybody in Ireland took on a personal debt. So even though they weren't told that, that what was happening, but the, the government bought all the national banks out because all of the banks failed. And when Kelly went, came to visit, one of the things you can see across all of Ireland is these things called ghost estates, which is buildings that were built, housing estates that were built purely to make money by speculators that nobody could live in, and they're now completely unoccupied. So the whole country is full of buildings that um, were built purely because the, the island was very rich at one point, and it was built entirely on a speculation bubble purely through architecture. So you've got um, Detroit representing one moment in global capitalism, Dublin representing another, and then the Philippines representing, I think, very, very kind of clearly an, another one as well. But, um, I guess maybe like the opposite of mm -hmm. Dublin, where people are trying to flock to these cities, and people are willing to occupy land illegally in order to, um, I guess, provide for their families and have a better livelihood. And so you start to see the opposite of like, in Dublin, there's unwanted land and unhou and like houses that are unoccupied because they're just completely unnecessary. And then you can't get enough of that in Manila. Um, and how people are willing to live in some pretty precarious situations in order to be closer to the center of capital and what that does to the capitalistic system that is the Philippines. Um, so, any other questions? Okay, cool. I guess. <laughs> All right, thank you guys so much. We really appreciate it.